adoption rate to about 22, 23, I think, percent in October of 2022. All of this together has increased poverty levels in Nigeria. Nigeria was named poverty capital in the world with more than 43% of Nigerians living below the poverty line in 2022. India, more populous country than Nigeria has now overtaken Nigeria. Of course, as we know, Japa itself and immigration rates, uh, Nigeria's relocate at the slightest opportunity, passport issuance is now at 38%. High employment rate is now about 33%. What does this mean? For you, for your company, and for me, um, individually and collectively, this of course means that 2023 from all indication is going to be a bumpy year. It's our election year, which means that government spending is not expected to immediately show up the deficits that we see. And it's safe to say that this will be a strategy session to help you get ready for 2023. The discussions that we've brought and we'd like to thank all of our speakers who are experts in their field are going to be discussing what you should be doing. In the face of all of these realities, what do you, what should you be doing? How should you be maximizing your limited resources? Without further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome, of course, I'll always start with ladies. We are very, very um, happy to welcome our speakers. Rena, forgive me if I don't pronounce your last name properly. And once I finish, please help me. It's Rena Osiemi. Did I pronounce it well, Rena? Yes, perfect. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm particularly <laughs> pleased that I did. And Secretary, can you please help me project? I'm struggling right now to project her, to get her on the screen. Yes, thank you. Okay, so Rena is the Chief Operating Officer for Zinvest a digital wealth management firm, and that's a subsidiary of Zcrest. She's a certified investment and wealth management professional with over 14 years of experience in business development, strategy, product management, and solutions development. She has cognitive experience in entrepreneurship. That's an interesting one, Rena. You have to tell us what that's about evidenced by her valuable contributions in five new businesses over the course of her career. Well done, Maria. She started her professional career as a relationship officer at Access Bank in 2008. And after five years at the bank, she joined AXA Masset as unit head business development and later rose to position of head, of head solutions development where she's responsible for driving skill and business goals. Thank you, Rena. She moved from being um, a microbiologist. Uh, she's an alumnus of the Lagos Business School. And right now in her personal life, she's an ardent tech enthusiast and is deeply involved and interested in VR, AR, Metaverse. Interesting, Rena, I can't wait. Okay, so let's go on to the next speaker. Welcome, Reina. Hand clap for Reina, Thank please. You. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adela. Thank you very much. Can we move to the next person so I can just introduce all of them? Thank you. Jimmy, forgive me. Um, Jimmy Ogobine. Am I correct? Okay. You're correct. Thank you, Jimmy. Jimmy is head of consulting at Agosto and Co Consulting, and he also heads the research of Agosto and Co. And um, Jimmy was Jimmy created the framework for this day's BGL Index, Nigeria's premier independent equity market index, established by leading investment bank and newspaper publication. He also initiated coverage notes on banks and cement companies while he was in the research and strategy unit of BGL PLC. 
He joined Consolidated Discounts Limited in October 2021. And over the years, he's been involved in various pioneering work and helped management achieve goals and targets. And he's a regular contributor to This Day and Business Day, and also speaks on CNBC and Channels TV. Jimmy has attended financial courses at Euro Money School of Finance, West African Capital Market School, and volunteers as a mentor for youth seeking new career goals and opportunities. He's a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria and graduates of accounting of Yaba College, uh, Yaba College of Technology. He's also an alumnus of Lagos Business School. And uh, so of the senior management program. Welcome, Jimmy. Can we go on to the next participant? Thank you. Sorry, next panelist. Bonju Fakaye. I'm sure I pronounced that one right, Bonju. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you did. <laughs> Thank you. Bonju is currently VP Strategy and Transformation of FBN Quest Limited. She's an experienced strategy and innovation professional with over 15 years experience leading transformation efforts across various functions in financial services. At her current role, she's um, the vice president of strategy. She's responsible for formulation, articulation, and execution of strategy for asset and wealth management division. Mm. She began her career in investment banking in the UK working for Barclays Capital and Goldman Sachs. She has an MBA with distinction from Cass Business School in the UK and a BSc in Business Economics from the University of Leicester. She's passionate about analyzing and solving problems. So Bonji is going to be solving some problems for us, some financial problems for us to create better and sustainable structures that inspire and motivate others. Welcome, 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 welcome. Next Thank person, you. please. Thank you, Moyo. I see you encouraging me. Thank you. Moyo. Moyo Sore Awokweba is a group head financial planning and analysis at Tangerine Africa. She is a financial business partner expert and a fashion entrepreneur with over a decade experience navigating various sectors, insurance, big data and analytics, management consulting and fashion across Africa. She's group head financial planning and analysis at Tangerine Africa, empowering people and businesses across Africa to lead financial secure lives through world-class insurance and pension solutions. She's also the founder and creative director of Emotives by Moyo, an Afrocentric fashion brand offering the best in textile and textile and ready-to-wear clothing. She's also, okay, she's also an alumnus of Lagos Business School and a level two candidate of the CFA Institute and a student member of AC, ACCA. She's a business finance facilitator at the IPC Academy for Event Planners. So welcome all of our... Thank you. Thank you, thank you to all of you. So the first general question, we're going to get straight to it, I'm, I'm really intrigued. So if I'm going to be succeeding in my, this is not in the script. If I'm going to be succeeding um, in 2023, do I need to enroll at Lagos Business School? Because it looks like, Bonju, Bonju, you are like the only person here that is not from Lagos Business School. I work there, so. Oh. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, aren't we, aren't we missing one person? I think I saw from Lotus Capital, Adiola. Um, apologies, people. apologies. Yeah. I'm so sorry, Moshud Babatunde. Can we have Moshud? Thank you. Thank you so much. I got so excited. Moshud is still smiling. Thank you. You're very kind. <laughs> Moshu is Group Finance Director of Lotus Capital Limited. He's, um, he has over 15 years of financial and management experience in the financial sector and the capital market. Okay, so we'll, we'll learn about shares. His areas of specialty include corporate strategies, financial advisory, investment portfolio management, 
treasury management, business restructuring, interesting, audits and tax management, financial performance measurement, enterprise risk management, and business analytics. Who wants me to offend Moshud? Please, can we go back to Moshud? I haven't finished with Moshud, please. Thank you. In fact, I'm going to leave Moshud here, please. At Lotus, he's responsible for overall medium to long-term, wow, okay, corporate business and financial strategies. He has successfully developed and implemented various strategy turnaround innovative projects, which position Lotus Capital as a market leader and a one-stop financial supermarket. Mashud has previously worked with Access Bank and McCoy Zam Nigeria Limited. He is a fellow chartered accountant. He holds an MBA and he's an alumnus of, you guessed it right, Lagos Business School and the University of Lagos. Okay, so welcome everybody. Welcome, hand clap for all of you. And thank you so much. Thank so much. maybe maybe Moshu will just spend one second to just answer me. So do I need to get ready for 2023? Do I need to register with Lagos Business School? <laughs> thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. I think it will be a good idea to be a member and alumnus of uh, Lagos Business School since, uh, yeah, yeah, as you can see, all of us here, <laughs> uh, <laughs> alumnus. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good uh, uh, is my, is a my good view. score. I I agree. I agree. Reading all of your profiles, I, I completely agree. Thank you and welcome everybody. And so for everyone joining the team, um, joining the panel today, welcome. And just so that we know who is who, can you please change your display name to your real name if you haven't done that already? Just so that we don't mistakenly call you Mommy Tope when you want to be known as Adiola Olumeo, for example. And please keep your microphones muted when you're not speaking so that we don't get noise like my phone just did now when we're listening to all of these fantastic tips from all of the panelists. And we want this to be participatory. So please use your raise hand function if you have questions or type it out. I'll be looking out for those and I'll be putting all of those together to ask the panelists. If there's any person that you want to answer in particular, you can also say this is directed to this person and I'd have them answer that. We're recording this session so that you can reference to it later. This is for the whole 2023. So, I mean, I know all of us would want to go back because one thing or the other, you'd like to remember to get yourself ready. So going straight into it, Monjo, from a global economic viewpoint, what should we expect for 2023? Thank you, Deola. Um, and it's really good to be here and nice to meet all the other panelists as well. Um, so Deola, I think, you know, in your intro, you covered a lot of the grim of what 2022 has been. And, you know, looking ahead to 2023, um, sorry to bring the bad news that I don't think much of that <laughs> is changing, okay? So, um, I mean, there are a lot of indicators to kind of watch out for. Um, let me start by, you know, just reminding us that there has been a pandemic in, in the recent past, right? And the global economy was sort of just kind of emerging from that um, before 2022 hit. And we had the Ukraine-Russia conflict, which was through supply chain um, shocks and basically unsettled the world. And what we've seen this year, and I believe will continue into next year, is... Um, high inflation, rising inflation. Um, and so globally, I don't see that that is really on a stopping train, maybe maybe except for the US, which seems to um, have surprised everyone recently and you know, sort of maybe peak it, at its inflation. But rising inflation usually just means you know, rising interest rates, which we've seen this year as well. And I believe we'll continue into next year. Um, central banks have to increase the interest rates to just kind of curb demand and try to, you know, stabilize and bring everything into sort of equilibrium. So with that, um, you will also expect that unemployment will, will also rise. We've seen in the tech sector that um, there have been a lot of layoffs recently. In the US, even I think it's about 85,000 layoffs. In Nigeria, um, as recently as a couple of days ago, I think Chipakash mentioned, 
um, some some layoffs. So in the tech sector, we've seen a lot of um, unemployment, or a lot a lot of um, job cuts, um, and you know that is really a lagging indicator. We think that that will you know still in show us later on next year um, that we are very much in a recession next year. We are in a stagflationary environment in the sense that, um, you know, as I explained, the inflation continues to rise. And if I want to talk about some of our global economies, um, you know, I've mentioned the US and I said, you know, the, the Fed seemed to, you know, they've had a hawkish stance in the past. They've been prepared to do anything in terms of, you know, rising interest rates to um, manage their economy. Um, since their economy seems, you know, manufacturing has bounced back, you know, um, we saw that this week in, in the US very slightly. Um, but I think that the unemployment aspect might still play out because what it's basically telling us about the US is that um, they haven't restructured much, apart from the tech industry, corporates have not restructured much to sort of temper what is happening um, globally. They might be okay, but the rest of the world the UK, for example, where we've seen interest rate, I mean, sorry, energy prices um, push inflation up. Um, you have to, and they've had Brexit, so they've lost a lot of people um, in the UK, um, job-wise. Um, and so you just expect that in the UK, you will see that unemployment will continue to rise. You will see that um, prices will continue to rise. You will see that the Bank of England, and they've indicated that next week they might increase um, um, interest rates again by about another 0.5 percent, right? Um, so I don't see any global economy really kind of spending their way out of this. They have to make the realistic decision to make the necessary cuts where possible. That's in terms of companies, sectors managing what's happening. Corporates have to restructure. There's no other way. Individuals have to kind of review how they want to approach 2023. We've seen in China, for example, um, because they had a resurgence of COVID, they've had to have like a complete lockdown. And we've seen what that has done to their economy recently. Now, there are indications that China might reopen, you know, sooner than what we expected. But again, restarting that economy is going to take time. So what am I basically saying? I'm saying that 2023 is um, very, it's going to be very harsh. Um, the reality is that central banks have to do what they're doing to curb the inflation rates. Um, as long as the Russia-Ukraine conflict remains, um, we expect that we'll still see, you know, I mean, supply chain shocks have sort of eased, but we expect that provided that, you know, the general political environment does not significantly change. So tensions between the US and China, for example, either that there are no real surprises there the trends that we're seeing now are continuing, at least for the first part of 2023. Um, maybe later in 2023, you might see that um, things begin to improve and central banks might feel comfortable to start cutting um, interest rates and um, see more expansionary um, policies to drive you know, the economic growth. But the truth is that the global economy will shrink. It has to. And with that, there will be some harsh realities in terms of what people and companies will be facing um, next year. So I, I don't think that we are seeing a real let up of the harsh realities of 2022 or the challenges of 2022. And I do honestly think that the sooner um, the realities are embraced and, um, you know, addressed, whether it is on the government policy level or on the corporate level or the individual level, um, the sooner that all of that happens, then the sooner we can emerge from this. But as it is, 2023 is looking pretty grim, unfortunately. Sorry. Thank you, Bonju, uh, for delivering such grim news. We, um... <laughs> I would like to say my pleasure, but it really isn't. <laughs> So, Jimmy, do you have a sliver of hope that you would offer to us, or do you align with her assessment? Okay. Um, um, yes, the it's it's quite um, obvious that in terms of the global transmission, what we would tend to see, um, we would tend to see a lot of risks um, from the global environment. 
um, you would all agree that COVID sort of pushed us into an apocalyptic um, scenario in terms of crisis. And shortly after that, we thought we had seen the worst. And Mr. Putin decided to um, visit some hostility to his neighbors and was seeing the evidence of that as well. And we're possibly looking at a recession in some of the major economies. Um, China is pursuing a COVID zero strategy, which has an impact on global production. So that's what um, will be seen from the global environment. And to just add a thing or two to what Bonjo had said earlier, for Africa, the world is, um, the investment community, the global investment community is quite apprehensive about Africa. Are we going to see um, defaults in 2023? Has Africa finally pushed itself to that unsustainable debt levels? Um, if you're following the news closely, Ghana, Ghana's party has ended. And all of the, so finally Nigerians can um, heave a sigh of relief that the endless, the endless, so the endless pointers to Ghana, how right the Ghanaians are getting it and how wrong we are. And how wrong we are getting it. I think finally we can heave, not like we like what's happening with them, but um, it just shows you that even if the, if when the debt crisis knocked on its doors in Africa, it was the poster boy of the, con of, of, of the continent that you know, received this massive, that welcomed the angel of debt crisis, um, sorry to use that phrase. Of course, Zambia has also had its own crisis before now. So there are possibilities that a few African countries may face um, debt crisis, especially on the foreign portfolio debts. And what has happened in Ghana is even a bit scary because um, they are they, they, they're talking about defaults or haircuts. So just to explain that, um, they say to debtors, if you owned about the 100 Ghanaian CD or in, in, in debt portfolio, that's if you if the government of Ghana were owing you a hundred Ghanaian CD, then they would have to take a 30% haircut to that, which means what the government of Ghana is owing you is now less. And in economics, we've always argued that it's difficult for nations to default in their local currencies because the central banks have recourse to printing. But we're not talking about Ghana. Let's come back home a bit now. So for Nigeria, um, if we're to reel into Nigeria stories, then we'll just continue with the negative tales. And we have a lot of us to talk about. So I'll just leave that for another, you know, we'll continue that discussion, but just to highlight on the question we've said. For Nigeria, this is the upside. The upside is that a lot of the problems we are facing on the macroeconomic end, thankfully, can be corrected with the right policy framework. So we have the right policies in the mix, and we can actually be a good, a good, um, a good news story in these times of lots of bad news. So the question then becomes: Do we have the political will to embark on these reforms? Okay, and if you permit me to just at least put some pointers to that question that I've also um, sort of raised now. We know we're embarking on an election in the first quarter of next year. And I just said that with our, our, pol our policy issues and the kinds of um, slow growth we're experiencing, a 2% growth rate, an average of about 2.5% in the last seven to eight years, which means that our population growth rate has outstripped our GDP growth rate. So on the average, as a country, our people are poorer because the economic growth rate is less than the population growth rate. So the average wallet, the wallet of the average Nigerian has basically shrunk over this period. Let's look at it from an aggregate perspective. 
But the good news is this. We got into this mess or this morass, so to say, because of our policy inactions. And where we took policies, maybe policy missteps. And in some areas, we didn't even have policies to address these issues. Yes, we do recognize all of the global issues, but we can correct our narratives with the right policy framework. With the right policies, we can correct our narrative. Okay, Adiola. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, at least a little sliver to hold on to. And, I, and on a corporate level, I know that uh, global supply chains have been affected and Nigeria being largely a consumer country. And I'd like Moyo to weigh into this now. So if the Russian-Ukraine crisis persists, do you see this further stretching the global supply chains and do you think it will hurt global economy further? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Adela. Um, and it's great to be here. Um, to your question, um, I'll say yes. Um, reason being that as of June, um, the sh shipping costs were had grown as high as 60%. And there's been a huge strain on the supply chain. Um, Roger had mentioned earlier some of the impacts of the Russian-Ukraine crisis on the global economy. Um, talk about the global inflation rates um, rising. Talk about um, the uh, sorry, global inflation rates rising. Talk about all of the eco economic indices basically not looking good. Um, and that we can imagine will continue and persist into 2023. Um, there's been speculation of, of um, a lot of countries going into recession next year. Um, and then there's been an estimation, estimated cost of about 2.88 trillion loss um, as a result of the crisis and the, the war, right? And that will only further, you know, put a strain on the economy and as a result, um, the global supply chain as well. Um, in terms of cost of exporting, cost of shipping and all of that across countries. So we, it's safe to assume that it will, it, an, extended, um, an extended timeline in, of this war will definitely affect the global economy at large. Thank you. Okay, you, you've all given us a very solemn, thought-provoking, I, I like the approach that, you know, this is something that we have to look at seriously and start to prepare for, and which is why we're having this conversation. Um, between Gonju and Jimmy and, your, and Moya Sora, you've also mentioned to us, you know, that look, all over, this is something that is experienced across countries. It's not limited to Africa, but hopefully, and the economy itself uh, needs to pick up. Um, Jimmy's told us, you know, we just need to kick ourselves in the behind and we just might be able to sail through this. Um, Rena, do you think there might be a global recession? in 2023? Um, I know, you know, it's interesting that we're all smiling when we're making grim statements. Um, Bonju had already mentioned- That's what I said to Bonju. She, <laughs> she delivered it with a smile. With a smile, because <laughs> what can we do? You know, I really wish the answer to that was a strong no, but you know, Bonju had already you know, added to that. We're seeing global growth slowing sharply. There's a lot of, um, a lot of that has been driven by like insecurity and, um, instability globally, an extended period of that, you know, if I may add. Um, there's the Ukrainian-Russia war, which everyone knows about, which, you know, has driven commodity prices up. Food and energy, you know, costs have gone up, driving inflation. There is, um, so there's still some aftermath effects of COVID because, you know, there were stimulus packages that were, uh, that was pumped into the economy and, you know, that has an inflationary effects, right? And so we've seen a lot of central banks um, try to curb or manage inflation by the rate hikes, right? All of that, I mean, a recession is when we have an extensive decline in you know, economic activity and yield 
Technically speaking, you'll see that um, two consecutive quarters have a decline in GDP, which is a measure of economic activity, right? And it's you would see that um, in a recession, there is you know low productivity or economic activity. There is um, low consumer demand. There's high unemployment. And we're already seeing all of these things. So definitely, the global recession is on, on the horizon. It's definitely going to happen. I mean, you know, we always we are very careful to say definitely because well, we don't see anything that's going to change that, right? And um, if you look at reports from like the World Bank um, presidents, you know, economists, analysts, you know, across the world, you know, everyone you know, reaching that consensus. So yeah, definitely, um, probably, highly likely, <laughs> we will see a global recession happening in 2023. And I'm delivering that with a smile as well. This is very grim news. Katila? Okay, um, I'd let Moshu decide if he would continue with a smile. So we've heard that very likely there'll be a highly likely, I'm trying to use the same words that Rena used, there'll be a global recession. For us, Nigeria, if you were to advise on the national macroeconomic viewpoint, what do you think we should expect? Mushroom in 2023. Okay, thank you, Adiola. Uh, I think it's a very uh, interesting uh, 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 point to look at what is going to happen to average Nigeria and the Nigeria economy in 2023. 2023 is going to be a very uh, eventful year for Nigeria. And not only Nigeria, I think generally. Uh, for the for the world, um, if you look at it uh, from the political point of view, uh, in 2023, uh, Nigeria will go to uh, to the poll to elect a new set of leaders. Uh, that will happen in the first quarter of the year. As we are all aware, that whenever this um, this transition program, uh, you tend to see uh, a cautionary approach from uh, the investor and even the economy, because people will tend to um, approach uh, uh, all the economic decision from the point of a safety, where the liquidity will be the king. The same year, we are also going to have a change in the administration, uh, which uh, we mark almost the end of for, uh, first half year. Um, that means that uh, the very first half year. Is going to the focus will be in, or, or, on the political transition, and when there is a focus on political transition, uh, we have to be very mindful that uh, Nigeria is economy is being uh, managed from the point of view of fiscal policy and the monetary policy. I think if you look at it from the monetary policy and taking the, taking a clue from what happened in 2022, inflation was around. 21% as at October. If you recall, in January, it was about 15%. And um, going into 2023, with other macroeconomic issues that we are dealing with, uh, looking at it from the uh, foreign exchange and some other things, it's expected that the inflation will still continue, um, most especially for the first half of the year. Um, it's expected that maybe by the time we are getting to the second half of the year, uh, there might be some moderation. And according to the World Bank projection, it's going to be about 17%. And talking about the monetary policy, you know, whenever there is an inflation, it's a responsibility of CBN to step in. Because it's one of the mandates that CBN has to ensure that uh, inflation is managed, uh, the stability and the value of our, our currency is also maintained. Uh, if we if we if we follow what um, uh, uh, CBN approach is in 2022, it has been a very hawkish approach to stem down the the rate of inflation. We expect this to continue, and um, as we are going into 2023, I think the right expectation is that uh, CBN continue to manage the inflation using different monetary policy, including. NPR. Uh, NPR has been raised uh, like three or four times this year 
from 11% and I think it's currently about 16.5%. Um, so it's expected that this will continue. And um, if we move away from the uh, inflation, um, we also need to uh, uh, consider one other major macroeconomic uh, uh, factor that uh, affects a major economic decision we do in Nigeria. That is on our currency, the value of the Naira. Uh, in 2022, we knew what how Naira has moved from what it was uh, sometime in January to about 444 uh, uh, in recent time at the official window. At the parallel window, it's, it's almost like a 735 or 40 uh, this week. It has touched about 900 uh, in the last um, few weeks. Um, so why, why do we have this? I think we can attribute it to a mismatch of demand and supply. Uh, demand and supply uh, of the effects. Uh, part of uh, the demand is because we are import dependent and that hasn't changed. And it's not also expected that it will change in 2023. Uh, the impact of these um, rise or stable demand in uh, effects is that the inflation, we are importing inflation because the supply chain across the globe is already disrupted. And as long as our currency is weak, we are importing inflation. And on the side of the supply as well, we know that um, most of our remittances that we get from the oil revenue uh, has been likely impaired due to oil theft and the rest. In the recent time, we've seen some measures from the federal government in curtailing this. We expect that it will continue in 2023. We also feel that there will be an increase in the oil production. All of these, uh, in, in addition to uh, structural measure from the security point of view, we believe the supply we, we improve. But one of the things I also think from the monetary point of view, monetary policy point of view will happen is uh, attempt by Central Bank of Nigeria to unify the uh, exchange rate. And if this is done, it's expected there will be a stability. And in terms of even projecting what the value of Naira is. It cannot come, it will come then in its own price because uh, the, the intrinsic value of the Naira uh, will reflect by the tactical devaluation. But the good news here is that the, the, the difference between the official uh, window and, uh, and, the par and the parallel will be uh, narrowed. We also need to talk about the economic growth uh, in 2023, I think um, uh, I do not see a recession, but I think it's slow growth in the economy. Uh, we are looking at 3.2% in 2022. Uh, we expect that 2023, uh, um, under normal circumstances, should be better than 2022, but it's not, look, it's not really looking like that. Um, based on the projection, I think it's looking at about 3%. We know what this means. It's, it's, it's a tough time ahead. And the, uh, the business environment uh, is already getting up for that. I must also talk, uh, mention the uh, budget, the government uh, uh, fiscal uh, plan for 2023. We already have about 20 trillion budget, but we also have to note that uh, about half of this, which is 50% of it, about 10 trillion, is, is uh, going to be borrowed. That means we're having a deficit budget. When we have a deficit budget, the idea is to stimulate the economy, but we should not also take our eyes off the borrowing. So meaning that um, the government will come to the market, capital markets generally, to come and borrow. And uh, looking at the, the projecting federal government, uh, there's going to be more local borrowing than the, than the, uh, you know, than the uh, uh, Euro bond for um, the uh, for the business in the capital market is expected that there might be uh, crowding out of um, from um, financing from the federal government. Um, many fund managers and uh, the the investor might tend to move towards uh, fixed income instruments. Most especially, I mentioned is it is going to be a year of transition uh, because. 
um, many people would like to turn on the side of caution, uh, on the side of uh, liquidity. So we expect that there might be a slight increase uh, or a relative stability of what we are uh, experiencing in the yield of the fixed income instrument uh, in 2023. We should also note that uh, there's going to be, there might be a shift in the economic policy uh, because of the change in administration. Uh, when uh, that will happen, we may likely see that in second half of the year, which my focus, I mean, continuation of the uh, massive investment in infrastructure, which is expected to create uh, relative employment, um, I mean, to address some social uh, issues uh, in terms of um, um, making it easier uh, to address the cost of rise and the cost of uh, uh, living because inflation is already dealing. Uh, I must also mention that 2023, uh, based on the, the federal government's plan, there might be a removal of subsidy. All subsidy uh, has been a very controversial uh, uh, point in, in, the, in the national discourse. But the federal government has made us to understand that definitely come in July, there might be a removal of subsidy. Well, uh, it's a double S word, uh, in my own opinion. Uh, the reason why uh, the, the, there is a clamor for the removal of subsidy is also to plug the leakage and to plow back all these uh, savings into the uh, investment in infrastructure. But we must also know, uh, so that we also prepare ahead, that the removal of subsidy means immediate and direct impact on the, on the price of commodities. So it's expected that inflation will go up. It might be temporary, not uh, long, long, long term, maybe short term to medium term, but it will have an immediate impact on the inflation. And when this happens, we tend to see increase in cost of running businesses and personal finances. So um, the idea thing is also to brace up, uh, when you say brace up for the impact. So the impact of the oil subsidy remover is, is imminent if it is eventually removed. But we also expect a, a kind of um, a support from uh, federal government when all these savings are reinvested into the infrastructure and um, some other structural uh, uh, adjustment that might be made to also ensure that um, the impact is not far felt. Um, the fiscal policy, I think uh, that it's not, I, I do not expect a major change in the fiscal policy. Uh, we've been told that there might be some implementation of uh, new taxes, uh, telecom and the benefit taxes. Uh, I think that should happen sometimes in January. And uh, for, for, for the um, supply chain along that sector, it's also expected that there might be some adjustment in pricing. So uh, we must also expect that. Um, Thank you, Mashud. Uh, if I can um, put it at that level. Thank you so much, Adela. Thank you very much. Um... You, you've said a lot of thought-provoking things, um, saying that we're importing inflation is uh, is a big hit, but I think, you know, from all indication, that's just the truth. And, and it's good that you also mentioned to us, you know, about the impact of the subsidy removal. That hasn't been removed, or but we, we feel it already. And businesses feel it, and there's the direct heat. It's good to know that there might be changes second half and interestingly you seem to disagree with most of the other speakers you in, in your opinion and you don't think that there will be a recession in fact you're predicting that there might be growth albeit slow Bonjo, do you agree with the assessment so i think Deola, you touched on a lot of the things that i found interesting about um Moshu's, um contribution and to a large extent, I agree with most of what he said. Um, so let me start with um, the monetary policy side of things. Absolutely 100% in agreement. There is no other way. The CBN is going to continue to um, respond in a hawkish manner to you know, the rising inflation. So NPR will continue to increase um, CRR will, will, I mean, CRR is currently, they increased it recently, 
from 27.5 to 32.5. So liquidity in the system is very tight already as it is. And the CBN will be continue will continue to be happy to do that um, to curb inflation as much as possible. Um, the new um, directive that came out this week on the limitations of withdrawals and all of that, personally for me, I think it's a good move, right? Um, what it does for us basically, obviously they're reprinting the Naira, so they need to take out of circulation the, the older notes. But aside from that, what this does is just in, improve transparency and where there's transparency, there's accountability in terms of movement of funds. Um, in terms of implementation of that as well, I think, you know, if it's done on a BVN level, it can be. Um, if it's not an individual account level, I, I could just go and open accounts, you know, in multiple banks and, and get my 20K a week from three, five <laughs> different banks, but not to miss the point. So on the monetary policy, completely in agreement. On the fiscal policy as well, I mean, the fact that we are in, in, intending to borrow I don't know if it's a hundred and sixty-five percent or something ridiculous of the budget for 2023 is absolutely, I mean, it just lets you know the um kind of dire straits that we are in. And like we should said, it's to really try and stimulate the economy. And maybe that's what's informing your optimism for more of a slow growth versus an outright recession. Um for me, I think that you know. A lot of what will happen next year for Nigeria is also, you know, on the the other thread that we should touch on is also what will happen in terms of the political landscape. The populists have to select somebody who they believe can address the issues, like Jimmy mentioned, in, you know, make the policy reforms that need to be made so that on a macroeconomic level we can correct some of the things that need to be corrected. Paul subsidy, absolutely. The reality is that we cannot continue as a nation to, you know, subsidize petrol, diesel the way that we have been. So how are they going to address that? Ways and means borrowing. How do we sort of start looking at, at that for the government to finance the government? Because a lot of what has been happening this year in terms of, you know, short-term borrowing for the government has been ways and means. So do we look at something like maybe securitization of ways and means borrowing for the government, okay? Um, we have to also just consider where we need to be a bit more um, deliberate and bold in making the right macroeconomic policy reform. So I think, you know, a lot of panelists have said the things that we need to consider for Nigeria next year. I think Mashoud's analysis is, you know, very good. I still think you know a recession is imminent but i think we can agree to disagree um <laughs> on, on that um, and i think to to jimmy's points as well when he um you know touched on nigeria i think policy reform is absolutely critical to making sure that 2023 does not hit as badly and that it really depends on the politics you know um so yeah i, I mean that would be my my take on what we can expect from from next year I certainly hope that whoever is taking the reins of power will be bold, as you suggested, and deliberate. Um, thank you very much. It's, and it's good to have a good balance of opinions on the table. And I still haven't made up my mind who I'm swinging with. So I would, I, whilst we're all chewing on, on the opinion we have on the table and the different ways of looking at it, I'd, I'd like Jimmy to weigh in. And for all my panelists, just to say that, you know, I'm going to be asking that our responses are shorter now because there's so many questions to ask you. And um, so please, let's engage with everyone on the chat room and say more there and um, on the chat room. But I'm going to be asking that we we'll speed it up so I have a lot more. So Jimmy, and um, from what Moshud said, and also from Gonjo, Moshud's opinion is that there will be and slow growth, not a recession. Now, he's also mentioned that IMF has also projected that the Nigerian economy would actually grow to about 3% in 2023. And um, although our inflation rates would also drop to about 17%. If this happens, how will this impact me, impact you, impact everyone listening? And how does this affect our companies? Okay, 
Um, I'd just like to say that it's, it's very difficult to predict the future. And it's very difficult to say how things will play out tomorrow. And if we want to test how difficult it is to predict the future, let's take our minds back to this time, 2019. Who did see coronavirus? And even as early as February, you know, the first week in February 2020, who saw how long the world would be under a lockdown, unknown to an entire generation? The generation that did see the world war said they had never seen a thing like this. So we must admit um, um, how difficult it is to predict the future. Would there be a recession? Would there not be a recession? So what can we do? Because you've also asked a question around corporate planning and even personal finance management. What can we do under these circumstances where we do admit the limitations of analysts to predict outcomes of the future? I think the first thing we can do is to look at scenarios, to say that, to first admit that it's difficult to predict outcomes and hinge our, our prognosis on scenarios. And I think it would be fair to also look at scenarios from at least two, three for corporate planning. So what I'm doing right now is combining two questions in one, looking at macro outcomes, possible macro outcomes, and corporate planning as well. So will there be a recession or not? We do not know, but we know what may lead to a recession, and we also know what may lead to high growth. We also know what may lead to the kind of stagnant growth we have seen the two to 3% levels. So what that means is this, what could lead us to a high growth scenario? Like I said earlier, the government needs to reform. So first, how do we think about these scenarios? The first question we should ask ourselves is, will the Nigerian government embark on policy reforms in 2023? And then secondly, we ask ourselves that if they do embark on reforms, which policy reforms would they embark on? And then thirdly, we can ask ourselves that how far will they go on these key reforms? And if you can add a fourth question, it will then be the key issues we need to reform. So what are the key issues we need to reform as a country? We need to, we need to talk about the subsidies on petrol, that energy space. We need to look at the subsidies on petrol, the electricity tariffs. That's it in energy. And then outside that, we need to say to ourselves that What's the FX strategy of the Central Bank of Nigeria? Because the FX strategy has a consequence on price, has a consequence on inflation. And then we also need to ask ourselves that what's the infrastructural management strategy of the government in 2023? Now, um, the other issues like security and all of that. So we need to also talk about security reforms. But we also need to know that 2023 is a transition year. The current government, which has been which, has, which has, has adopted an inertia approach to reforms, will stay till about five months in the new year. And the fiscal plan of the government, which is the budget of the government, will take us all through, um, all through the year. So it will take the new government some bit of time to settle, and then before if they have to come up with a new budget, we do not know. But in terms of corporate planning, what can we begin to think around? I just dropped some kind of, I just dropped a rough sketch of scenarios. So for corporate planning, we must adopt scenarios in our planning to say that are we in a high growth macro scenario, which is what I said that if we reform the subsidy space, electricity tariffs, FX strategy of the central bank infrastructure space, it could take us to a high growth scenario with growth upwards of around 7%. If we remain this, maintain the status quo, which is where things are today, we could see growth levels around where things are today. And if we, if we get worse on where we are today, say for instance, we increase the subsidies on petrol, we increase the electricity tariffs on, um, sorry, we continue with the kind of electricity tariff regime we have today where um, operators are not able to recover their cost of equity and the central bank's um, demand management strategy continues, then we could, it could take us into a recession. So it's one of these three, but we're not prophets yet. So the question I'll then ask to come down to the question of corporate planning. First, we need to hinge our thoughts on these scenarios and ask ourselves at every point in time, 
where are we along these scenarios firstly? And then to also note some things in monitoring the environment, we also have to keep our eyes on some key indicators. For instance, when we talk about the three prices of the economy, interest rates, exchange rates, inflation, interest rates are rising today, which means if you are a borrower, the interest rates are rising. So the question you need to ask yourself, even in your own personal finance space or as a corporate planner, is if interest rates are rising, why are interest rates rising? So just to explain the back end of the economics, the central bank is trying to reduce inflation, trying to tame inflation. So they are trying to mop up excess liquidity from the system. So they are giving investors an incentive to invest in the Naira, which is why interest rates are rising. But on the other end, it has a downside. And what's the downside? That your borrowing rates, if you're a corporate organization, a corporate planner, or even an individual thinking of being exposed to a Naira loan, the borrowing rate on that Naira loan is probably going to increase next year. So the question you have to ask yourself is, why am I borrowing? So that's one key price we need to look at interest rates. The second key price we need to look at is exchange rates. We're seeing the kinds of volatilities in the FX markets. The question you need to ask yourself today is this. First, I'll drop this. The rates we are seeing are the parallel markets today and not the real rates of the Naira. The Naira is more valuable than what we are seeing. In other words, we're seeing the downside risks of undue and blind speculation on the Naira. So all these rates of 700, 800, and even 900, and all the people predicting the Naira is going to get to 1,000. On the basics of the fundamentals, the Naira can only get to 1,000 on blind speculation. So the question then becomes, if you do not have need for FX at these crazy rates in the market, as a corporate planner, you probably should not be panicking to buy FX at those rates. Because with the right policy mix, the Naira should be appreciating in the parallel markets and in the official market. So the question as a corporate planner is, why am I buying FX at these crazy rates? What do I really need it for? If you really do not need it for anything serious, then you shouldn't be speculating. If not, you take a bit in because you probably do not even have the expertise for such speculation. So if, for instance, you bought the Naira at 900 or 850 when it was at those rates, today you're losing how much? Why do you want to lose at such times? And then thirdly, to talk about the th third key price, inflation. Inflation. Jimmy, is can you tie that to what to expect as an individual also? Okay. So that we can wrap this up. And I, 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 there are a lot of things that you've mentioned. I'd like to ask Moyo a few things on that. Okay. So in terms of as an individual, at times like this, your financial planning and your financial prudence need to, needs to be stronger. So um, to go really granular, at times like these, you need personal budgets. Whether you are a small business owner as an entrepreneur, or you are a salary earner, or you're a student on pocket monies, you need a personal budget. Yearly, quarterly, monthly. A, a, a budget tied to your incomes. Whether as a business owner or you know, as a salary earner, you need personal budgets so that before you embark on spending, you can actually see the full picture of what you have. And it's these personal budgets that can serve as a guide into saying to yourself that at this point, I probably can't afford this, or at this point, I should be going for alternative B because um, things are hard as it were, and it's not a Nigerian picture, it's a global picture. So. All over the world, you're hearing of cost of living crisis. So these are times to say to yourself that I need to have a personal budget. And on your personal budget, you can then, and the personal budget is not all about spending. It's also about that takes care of things like investments. So you should be, in times like this, it's quite interesting because people say to themselves, I do not have enough money. And the advice is, this is when you should be investing. So your personal budget should guide you into the kinds of investment choices to make and the investment choices not to make. I think it's as important telling people the choices not to make now because it's at times like these that these high interest 
um, investments tend to be quite um, lucrative and quite tempting. The Ponzi schemes of this world, the FX, all sorts of FX um, schemes that you have no expertise on, you have no knowledge on, you, you do not follow trades and you're going to most likely lose money and lose relationships with those who lead you into these investments. So it's important that in a bid to make money now, we do not lose money. It's as important as that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Let me you. Go, um, rest here now on this. Yes. But while you're resting, I'd like you to keep your thoughts going on the chat box. Um, okay. I, I feel Thank like <laughs> there's a lot that is still in there that I we want to draw out. And mm -hmm. I really feel bad that I'm rationing the time for everybody. It's that we want to get everyone in and out um, before we lose it because everybody is saying such important things. And Moyo, honestly, when I listen to Jimmy and um, Monju and Moshud, I I'm just thinking, what, what do you think will happen to the Naira in 2023? Mr. Demola, I see your hand. But um, once it's time for questions, I promise you, I've written down your name. Your name will be the first one to call. But I have a lot of questions that I want to ask that will benefit everybody. So please, don't worry. I have your name down. I, I'll call you once we start asking questions. So, Moyo, what do you think will happen to our Naira in 2023? We did appreciate. I know the EFCC chairman says he thinks it will. Or do you think it will weaken further? Okay. Thank you. Um... So, like you said, I also listened to him say that he will appreciate, and uh, if I recall, his um, opinion of it appreciating is basically based on the new, the, what I say, the um, redesign of the Naira and its impact on uh, money supply and how that will help curb inflation. Now, um, is that necessarily right? Or, I mean, is that necessarily correct? I think it has some merit. Um, I think that to some extent, it has um, it has its own impact on helping to curb inflation and um, money supply. Of course, we've seen CBN dole out several um, policies in recent times. We have the new... Um, the most recent one, which has to do with uh, um, daily amounts of amounts, you know, that people can access from the banks, um, both on the individual side and on the corporate side. Now, I feel like, I mean, I think that there are beyond just the money supply, there are other factors that can affect whether or not it will appreciate or depreciate going into 2023. Um, there is the issue of government debt that is consistently rising and how that would affect, um, how that would impact um, the FX rates, the balance of trade. Um, of course, inflation has its own place in the mix. Um, cash again is just 6% of money supply, right? And we're only, that these policies are only affecting just the 6% of money supply. Now, I'm one of those who think that by the end of the year, um, dollar will reach a thousand, a thousand naira. I'm actually one of those who believe that. But going into 2023, um, it's tough to say how things will play out. Like um, we know that 2023 is an election year. Um, the current administration, again, I think it was Moshud or Jimmy that had touched on the fact that um, the the current administration still has like five year, five months um next year and then even the new government has only barely the second half of the year to make any real policy change i think that it would appreciate on the on the grounds that you know some of the some of the suggestions that have been mentioned earlier are taken do i think we can see that happen next year absolutely not um and by th to that extent i feel like there will still be um further depreciation at the very least in the first half of the year. Um, and I think it will peak at that point. But going into the second half of 2023, um, there may be a some kind of appreciation for the dollar. Now, again, I, cur um, currently, um, as of today, if I recall, the CBN rate is still 445. And um, that's 
is not reflective of the true value of the Naira, if we're being honest. Now, if there is, if the CBN is able to further devalue the Naira, perhaps some of the, some of the pressures that we're seeing in the parallel markets might also be eased as, you know, the rates converged. But for now, um, I don't see that happening. And on the basis of that, I strongly still believe that at the very least in the first half of 2023, the dollar, the do I mean, the Naira will continue to depreciate. And then maybe towards the later end of the year, it will, um, the tide will turn. Thank you. Thank you, Moyo. Um, it's getting grimmer now, um, but it's good that we're talking and I'm, I'm glad to all of you. Thank you to all of you for giving us the green news, but also what you think your strategies are um, for that. I know that listening to you saying dollar would further depreciate, I know that in Moshu's analysis, he had mentioned that, you know, one of the things that would also drive this is if the fuel subsidy um, is removed. And he's also mentioned the impact that would have directly or indirectly on, on everyone. Um, now, everyone seems to agree that that fuel subsidy is likely to happen. And I, I also think that it's likely to happen. And um, Rena, do you think, you know, it might be next year? Or do you think that the new government might push it further to maybe 2024? And, and if it is removed in 2023, what impacts should we brace up for? Okay. <laughs> um, let me start with what the deregulation, I mean, I think everyone agrees that it is good for the economy, right? Because the subsidy and the savings from the subsidy removal will be um, allocated to other parts of the economy, other sectors, education, infrastructure, and whatnot, right? But for that to happen, it will get, or if that happens or when that happens, it will get really bad before it gets better. You know, like Moshe that um, alluded to, I think Bondra had said as well. Do you think it will be next year or I, would it be pushed you know, further? I, I struggle to see how that will be next year. You know why? Because um, if you think about the impact and the fact that we're in an election year, it will take a lot of political will, right, to do that. So the question is, who wants to be the bad guy? Is it the incumbent government, right? Do they want to do that before they go out or maybe be re-elected? Or is it a new president that um, then has to set up his cabinet, maybe somewhere in May, June, we start to see um, what the policies are looking like, right? I don't know that it's, first, it's going to be first on his agenda. And if it is, um, it's not going to be funny, <laughs> you see? So I think that one, is it possible? Yes. But I personally think it's highly unlikely that we ha it will happen in 2023. If it does, it will be much, much later down, down the line, down the um, later in the year, right? I personally think it's highly unlikely. I think they'll kick the car down the road again, especially because of where we are, um, um, the fact that elections are here. And I don't, it will take a lot of political will for that to happen. And I don't see anyone that wants to be the bad guy at this point. Uh, that's some hope to hold on to, and um, we, we hope that it, it doesn't happen, because like you and Mo should have agreed, it will have direct heat on, on us. It's um, very sad news when you say that it will get very bad before it then gets better. And hopefully with all of the mix that we have, um, that, that don't seem to be working well mm -hmm. you know, for all of us, I'm hoping that, like you've predicted, it will be further down the road and not 2023 to at least give us a breather. And for, for you, Bonju, because of your experience in wealth management, what should I do as an individual? And I is everybody listening on the call and those who would listen later on. What should we be doing to manage our resources and how should we be preparing for this doomsday scenario that has been painted right now <laughs> and please feel free to deliver it with a smile as always Adela <laughs> um you know I think Jimmy um 
you know, started it very well when he said, you know, everybody needs to have a budget. But I think that's the place to start from. Know what is necessary for you to spend money on next year and know what is nice to have. So start from there. And then check that your income can actually cover what is necessary for you. If not, and even if it can, then you need to start thinking also about your investment options. Now, the truth is that because of the inflation rates, many investments um, returns are being eroded, okay? Because inflation is higher than um, the rate of return on a lot of investment options. But it doesn't mean that investment is a bad thing. And I will start, you know, sort of, no level basic what you can do. And I can see that Moshud has, you know, Lotus Capital in the background. Jimmy has Augusto. Very nice. I'm going to plug FBN Quest, guys. Okay, start with us. <laughs> you can start with your mutual funds. Okay, mutual funds are probably the sort of basic entry for your investment. And there are different types of mutual funds. So you choose the one that suits you from money market to equity funds to bond, fixed income, whatever it is. Um, but again, you can choose a mutual fund to invest in. Um, and the good thing about mutual funds, yes, the rates on mutual funds um, are not going to beat inflation, but it's compounded interest, right? So you're making money on top of whatever it is that you are earning in your fund consistently. So consider a mutual fund. Um, consider, you know, um, inflation hedge sort of investments. And what do I mean by that? Um, you mentioned in your in your opening comments, and I believe somebody else might have mentioned along the line um, about you know Nigerians just upping and going, and a lot of Nigerians that are upping and going, guess what? They need cash quickly, and they are offloading a lot of assets, particularly real estate. Um, you call that distress sales. So distress sales is particularly when you want to. Um, it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong. It just means you need you need cash quickly. But always good to investigate. But again, distress sales. If you're a person that you know favors real estate, it's a good time. Keep your eye out. Look for good opportunities, good properties um, that you can invest in. Um, to to earn a return there also real estate investment trust so if you cannot afford a huge property there's real estate investment trust that you can also look at um, which kind of pool real estate assets together you can earn from that so again still a form of investment you can also look at commodities like gold right again please i want to stress that any sort of investment that you choose to participate in is very this is a very good time for you to have a financial planner or investment manager that can guide you in the right investment choices to make. It's not a time to throw away money, okay? Going back to your budget, right? If you're the person that is sending children to school abroad, you know, you need um, access to FX. Dollar investments are good for you. Moshu made a very good example, or, or maybe it was Jimmy, I can't remember. If you do not need dollar, there's no need for you to go out and look for the dollar, please. Do you know what I mean? Don't, it, what is also driving this parallel market sentiment is you know, just people just wanting to hoard the dollar for whatever reason. It's demand, right? But if you don't need the dollar, if you're not exposed to the dollar, you can invest in, in, in your Naira, okay? If you want to hedge against the inflationary pressures or the value of the Naira, then you can also invest in dollars. Uh, but the truth is that there are many investment options. Speak to a financial advisor, speak to somebody that knows what they're doing to make sure that you get the right advice, even if it's a mutual fund you want to invest in. If you're investing towards a short-term goal, like you want to pay your rent or you want to pay school fees, you know, there are the right investments to do that. If it's more long-term, there's equity sort of products that you can look at, like the stock market. Anybody that invests in the stock market is not expecting to get their money back tomorrow or, you know, in three months' time. It's a long-term game. But the truth I is suppose... that whatever... Yeah, sorry, please go ahead, Dela. I suppose this um, some of these things that you've mentioned are things that would also affect us as um, people working with organizations and, and thinking forward as well, or planning towards the end of the year for organizations. And, yeah. um, and please drop a, a, a little more of these thoughts on what we can do in the chat box. Sure. And um, 
once you put a link to first FBN quest and um, we'll come back to you with an invoice for advertisements. <laughs> <laughs> Please send the invoice to Jimmy and uh, Moshud as well because they are <laughs> silent. <laughs> okay. So let me turn to you, Rena. Um, Bonju's told us about individuals and what we should be doing. Jimmy's touched on that as well in his own um, admonition to us. So I'm sitting in the management boardroom and we're talking about planning for next year. What should I be contributing to that conversation from the perspective of a corporate organization? What should our approach be to expenditure and investment, which are the two key things that we've had Jimmy and Bonju stress on? And what should be our approach? Because of course, the resources are quite limited and as you've all predicted, will continue to be in 2023. And just give us three key things. Three key things. Think we should be doing, yes. Um, I think Mashud or was it Jimmy that already talked about your loans, right? Because rates are going to go up. Um, it means it will impact your business loans as well. So do you really need that loan? Do you need to restructure? Do you need to pay down now? Um, because it gets more expensive. Demand, consumer, consumer demand will be is expected to be lower, and that also is going to thin out your margins. So do you want to, what, what can you explore through your entire value chain and see where you can build efficiencies to become like more competitive or have a competitive advantage? Um, and you're going to face FX risks as well. I think Jimmy had mentioned that. Right. So if you're if you're hit, if you're a direct, um, if you're going to be hit by FX directly, you say you're an importer, and um, this would be a good time to front load your cost, meaning you can make purchases now because if you expect that then you know rates or, or prices are going to go higher, then if you lock down at a lower rate, um, it gives you a wiggle room to stay more competitive, right? Have a competitive advantage, maybe on price or even you know, um, boost your your should I say margins, right? Um, this is also the time like, I've spoken about, um, you know, becoming more efficient, um, you know, and just looking through your internal processes. One thing, if you're a brick and mortar um, business, you might want to slow down or even start to cut back on, you know, on expansion or, you, you know, you're reducing your physical footprints, right? And leverage more digital channels so that you can stay, you can, you can, you know, drive distribution at really low costs and um, save on energy costs because your brick and mortar business is going to demand a lot of um, energy, right? Um, maybe it's also a time to, you know, reconsider hiring or stay on the sidelines a bit um, or look at your business um, and see, do you need to hire? Um, but also because we expect a lot of uh, some layoffs um, as business are going to, business is going to be more vulnerable this season. Um, and so you should expect some layoffs. You're already seeing that globally with Meta and Amazon, you know, and whatnot. Um, you can also be on the lookout for like great talents that will be let off by your, let go by your competitors. But again, review your stance on hiring. Do you want to hire now and what your approach uh, would be right. Um, I think I think from that perspective, you can start to, you know. And then one more thing for like corporates or um, if you have like an entire value chain. So I use a Unilever for instance that have like uh, distributors. While you're assessing your own business risk, you should also look at the risks of your of everyone in the value chain. So if you have distributors, look at what kind of risks that they will face because that would directly impact their ability to you know. Uh, purchase from from you, right? So each each business again should um, like um, Jimmy had said in corporate planning. Look at different scenarios. Look at the different risks that you face. Look at the risks that your um, the value chain faces and how that directly impacts impacts you. That and then also um, <laughs> definitely don't keep free cash um, idle. You must always sweat all your assets, including free cash. Um, um, and obviously, you have to invest um, in a mutual fund, in a savings or investment account. Um, I, I suppose that also goes for individuals. This is not a time to hold any cash right now. But, uh, most free cash should be invested. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And we should be talking to Bonju or Mashud or Jimmy. Or Rena as the oh, managers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Rena. 
<laughs> oh, you're sorry. Don't worry. Don't worry. We'll, we'll give you a chance to, to also tell us what you do and how they should come back to you. And I also think you should keep in, engaging in the chat box. You know, there might be somebody who wants your number or your email and drop all those nuggets. You know, we invited you because we wanted to hear it, but we're restricted by time. But I'm hoping that you can still share some of those nuggets in the chat box, which is filled with questions for you guys. So we're going to be going to those questions. But before I do, in 30 seconds, I'll be starting with more shoot. 30 seconds only. Give me one thing that I should go away with. First, as an individual, and secondly, as somebody who is going to be, who is a director um, and sitting on a board, taking a decision for the company. This question is for everybody, but I'm starting with more shoot. 30 seconds, starting now. Okay, uh, thank you. I think the most important thing is uh, uh, to be uh, proactive or looking in terms of whatever, uh, I mean, ability to scope. What okay, I'm going to add more to your 30 seconds because I'm interrupting you now, but I'd like for everyone, when you are telling me, giving us your suggestions, start with saying for an individual, do X, for a company, do Y. So that you know, it helps us put in perspective. But if you think you, you know your thoughts are what what you're going to share is something that we can do generally, you can just also say the same. So we are restarting the clock for you. Thirty seconds starting now. Okay, I think everything everything starts with planning, and uh, it ends with uh, discipline and ability to uh, see it through in terms of implementation of strategies. Most of the time, it's not the absence of uh, knowing what to do, but ability to see it through and to also continue to evaluate, reevaluate till you are able to get through to the goal. For the corporate, I think most of what corporate should focus on is how, uh, uh, ahead of 2023, how they will be able to uh, position themselves for opportunities and also um, have some safety nets in case if everything goes south. And for the individual, it's also to have some sort of a financial discipline and to also ensure that uh, in the course of doing this, there's also a lifeline, a uh, lifeline uh, for diversification of the revenue streams and some further uh, safety nets that anytime uh, anything happens, there is always an opportunity to bounce back and to, to continue to grow in that trajectory. Thank you. Thank you very much. Rena, go. 30 seconds. Um, for individuals, I'd say um, this, this economic, um, the economy is cyclical, right? So you have recession and you have times of abundance. Um, don't, don't make rash decisions. Don't panic so you don't make rash decisions. So, um, you know, have a budget, stick with your budget, re, you know, and keep reviewing. Um, and similarly, for, for corporates, have a plan, right? But you can say this is all these different scenarios for 2023, but you know, stay nimble and flexible, and you know, keep checking, keep reviewing, um, so that you know how to keep up, you know, uh, per time. Oh, you're so muted. Right. Yes, I realized. <laughs> Thank you so much. In thirty seconds, and Gonju, your turn. Talk stats now. Okay, um, I think I touched on um, what individuals can do um, in quite some detail, so I won't repeat myself. Um, but for the corporates, I think this is, um, it's always an opportunity to um, be more innovative. So start looking at, you know, how you can, as a corporate, start looking at how you can um, improve the distribution of your product um, through things like, um, partnering through things like um, creating efficiencies in how you do things already, um, take advantage of, you will be surprised a lot of the um, um, systems and processes that you have that you're not fully fully utilizing, um, applications that you're not fully utilizing. So go back, you know, fully start looking at what you have and start um, maximizing it, basically. Um, and you'll find that you can be a lot more innovative in your delivery and also in your distribution of whatever it is that you're trying to sell. But I think 
trying to do any any cost management that you're trying to do is going to be extremely difficult because prices are still rising. So without tapping into innovation, it's going to be very difficult. Thank you. Jimmy, 30 seconds, go. Okay. So for corporates, let's start with corporates. For corporates, um, the key takeaway should be going into 2023, think along scenarios, think along scenarios. What that means is that have a scenario that says that if, for instance, if four prices go up, what would we do? How do we respond? If diesel prices go up, what should we do? And as you think along scenarios, you would find out that whatever outcomes that play out, you're not up for a shock on any outcome because your scenario probably works out a plan along each outcome. Now for individuals, I'll drop an action plan for you. Going into 2023 and not a New Year's resolution, make it a resolution at the end of this session, sharpen your financial planning skills, start budgeting. Immediately after this session, go on your phone, open a budget app or go to your system, open an Excel sheet today, even for the least, for the so-called dirty December, budget for it. For fun, budget for your fun. Today, just open that Excel sheet immediately after now and sharpen your financial planning skills. And then in the year, you'd find out that your financial, liter your financial literacy would improve. And then with time, you can sharpen your financial literacy as well. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Moya, sorry, you're on go. Okay. Um, I'll say for both corporate and individuals, this is the time to plan. Plan, plan, plan. And then, like has been mentioned, for individuals especially, you need to focus on your budgets. You need to be deliberate. Um, this is the time to leverage on financial experts around you. If you have to join communities, investment clubs are, usually, are generally available. They have a very a very number of them, you have the TGIC and I'll drop a list of investment clubs that I know um, in the chat box. This now is the time to leverage on those people. And then, um, you know, you can then position better to invest. For corporates, think through your process, think through your expenses and find areas where you can optimize your costs. So it's not just that you will cut down on cost, but also whatever you're spending, make the most of it, optimize your cost and um, try to be as innovative as possible in cost reduction this period. So, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. And I can assure you that we will come back to you again from time to time to ask you questions. And I know that there are a lot of questions already in the chat box, but I did promise Mr. Sunday Ademola that I will start with him. Mr. Sunday Ademola, you had raised your hand. Please feel free to unmute and ask your question in 30 seconds and 30 seconds only so that we can go to the questions that have been left in the chat box. And thank you everyone for the contributions. I see them. Thank you, Madam Madela. I actually want to ask the question where Mr. Jimmy was talking about the the, the impact of the uh, dollars. The dollars is going to maybe we are buying 700, going to 800, going to 1,000. It may not actually have impact on some of us that are not engaging in FSM products. But I want to ask that can, it, can that be true for a country like Nigeria where we are not producing? We export all our, those things we are buying in the market, are they not exported? I mean, are we not importing them from overseas? People that, I mean, the clothes we are buying in the markets, people imported parts from Dubai and the rest. And by the time they want to buy those clothes, they have to get the dollars at a higher price. And at the end of the day, we that we are using Naira to make a purchase before the clothes we are buying for under Naira, because the dollar have increased, 
their own purchase uh, amount also has also increased. So they transfer the price on us, the consumer, that we are making the final payment. And now we are buying what our Nera can buy before. So for example, 220,000 Nera can buy a clothes, a four years of clothes before. But now that dollars have increased, we are now buying in 40,000. Can we see, say that uh, dollars didn't have effect on us? So we should know that since Nigeria is not a production uh, nation, we are not producing, even the fuel we are buying today, why did everything is skyrocketing? It's because we are not producing it in Nigeria. We export it, and by the time we bring it back, we have to pay with higher dollars. And that's why everything is increased. I want to believe that if there is an increase in dollars, it will definitely affect everybody, every citizen of this Nigeria, until we move from production, I mean, from consuming, consumer to production. So that's just Mr. my Timala, question. Thank you. Yeah, thank I'm you. with you on. So I, I, I suppose that question is to Moshud. Looks like you mentioned his name when you were answering uh, Mr. it. Jimmy. But, um, oh, Mr. Jimmy, okay. So please, Jimmy, your question. Okay, um, so just to say a few things on, on the subject of FX. Um, the subject of FX is like any other demand and supply issue, which means that if you spend a hundred Naira, when you earn 20 Naira, you would end up with a deficit of, um, so if you spend a hundred Naira when you earn 80 Naira, you'd, you'd end up with a deficit of 20 Naira. And if you spend a hundred Naira, when you earn 120 Naira, then you would end up with a surplus of 20 Naira. And if you spend a hundred Naira, when you end the, when you earn hundred Naira, then you'd end up with a balance of nil. It's also how it happens with FX and how it happens with our personal wallets. If you spend more than what you earn, then you would end up with a deficit. It's also the same thing with FX. So as a country first, we say to ourselves that how much FX do we earn and how much FX do we spend? Once there's a mismatch between these two, something is going to happen. If you spend more FX than you earn, then your country's currency will weaken because you're going to end up with a, and I'm trying not to be too, so, um, too advanced with the explanation. So you end up with a, a weak current account position. So um, I hear Nigerians say a lot that we do not produce, we, we do not produce, we import all we do. The figures are not entirely, the figures do not, um, the figures we have do not entirely assert to it that we import too much or we do not produce as a country. Um, we do produce as a country and that's why vis-a-vis um, -vis other um, African countries, you'd see that our manufacturing GDP, our manufacturing GDP to the total GDP is probably better than what most African countries have. And even when we look at our imports to our GDP, you'd probably see that we probably even under import. So the problem then becomes maybe we do not export enough because our major export produce is crude oil. Okay. And we do not do enough of non oil exports, um, which is why I don't really against the um, Jaffa syndrome because everybody who um, leaves Nigeria, that's a potential um, receipt tomorrow in terms of diaspora remittances. The Indians are the first country in the world to hit a hundred billion dollars in diaspora remittances. At best, Nigeria will do $25 billion, just a quarter of that. Yes, we know our population is nowhere close to them. So that's not a problem for us. Now, in terms of the numbers, again, looking at the hard numbers, um, I also do not subscribe to this 1,000 to one because the, if you, if you were to crunch numbers on an Excel sheet using uh, maybe methods like inflation rate differentials, you'd find out the Naira is nowhere near 1,000 to 1, which is why we've said that with the right policies, a Naira will trade at a better value. And which is why I said earlier that I wouldn't be speculating on the Naira if I were in your shoes. What do I need the Naira for today? Why do I need the dollar? If I have no business, with the dollar, then I wouldn't be speculating with it. Because with the right policy actions, 
the speculators are in a likely position to lose. If you bought the dollar, for instance, at 850 Naira, with where the dollar is today, you've lost. And if the dollar does not get back to that level, your, your, your losses will tarry for a while. And if the dollar doesn't get to this so-called 1,000, this proverbial 1,000, then your losses will even tarry even much longer than that, okay? So are there pressures? Yes, there are pressures because we've not taken the right policy actions, which means that we have to allow rates harmonize between the official market and the parallel market. And when rates harmonize, what that means is that you could possibly see an appreciation in one market, most likely the parallel market, and see some level of depreciation in the official market. And then those rates harmonize. And when those rates harmonize, they'll be nowhere near all of these speculative rates we are currently seeing. We would have pass on some cost to us. Interesting views because right now, most businesses probably already get their efforts in the parallel markets. And if you were to go to a bank today to pitch to bid for, let's say, $1,000 on your form M to import, you probably only get $200 from them, which means the $800 will most likely come from the parallel market, which has already been priced into the rate of goods and services today in the open markets. So what that means is that if we harmonize rates, businesses will probably not even suffer more because they've already priced that into the current cost of doing business, which is reflecting on the cost of goods and the cost of services in the open market today. Um, Thank you, Jimmy. Okay. Um, Thank you. I think that's that's very, very insightful and it's food for thought. I, I hope, you know, it works out exactly as you said. I keep getting the chills from Moshud, or was it you that said um, nobody can really predict the future? Hopefully it works out as you said. And there's a question that that on the chat box, somebody's asking, what impact will the recent CBN withdrawal limits have on the economy? I'd like one of the ladies to please take this. What impact will the recent CBN withdrawal limits have on the economy? I mean, I, I think it was already, um, I think it was Bondra that already spoke to it. Um, there is already a cashless policy in place, right? And this just fits like a glove into that policy, right? Uh, but what it, ha what it helps us do is track, right? So there's a lot of transparency around movements of funds. And I think it was, um, yeah, so you can see the in and out of funds. Because at the end of the day, and I had a conversation was must have been earlier today or yesterday. Why do we need so much cash, right? And I think that um, infrastructure-wise, I think we are already poised to manage um, a lot of these, you know, um, digital transfers, if you like, um, whether it's through your um, bank apps or through USSD for those that don't have smartphones, you have mobile money operators, um, even in remote areas for, you know, for those in remote areas, right? So I personally don't see um, to the general populace what the, if there's going to be a negative impact, if anything, it would just drive more adoption of digital channels, it will drive transparency. Thank you so much. And I spotted another question here. And thank you, thank you, um, Moyo. Thank you, everyone has been dropping links for, for us to join. Thank you. Somebody's asking, what is the right policy mix that will support an appreciation of the Naira? And that has been touched on. And so I'd just like us to answer that very quickly, um, maybe in another 30 seconds so that we can get people out of here as soon as possible. Who would like to attempt that for us? Mashud, I think you started us out on this policy mix. Would you like to throw in your words? Okay. Thank you, uh, Adio. I, I think um, without um, repeating what uh, many people have said, um, the intrinsic value of Naira uh, is much, much better than what it is on the parallel. And I think what um, should drive the real value of Naira is the possibility of uh, unification of the exchange rate. So if um, there is that will or the policy drive to unify the exchange rate, I think the element of a speculation will be 
um, if not 100% eliminated, but will be uh, reduced to next to uh, nothing. Uh, because if what you can get on the street, uh, what you can get in the bank is what you are getting on the street. Uh, I, I see no reason why you also want to take additional risk of going to the streets to change the money. Um, also, what I also think that can also um, um, support the appreciation of the Naira is also coming from the structural uh, policy uh, or, or what you can uh, also regard as the uh, other side of the policy fiscal. Because um, like uh, Jimmy has said, the uh, volatility in the exchange rate is driven by the mismatch of the demand and supply. Uh, while we are talking about the demand, we also also talk about the supply. The supply is when we uh, the the economy needs a dollar and they are able to get it at the official window or the the, the real window. So um, if we are able to get the uh, oil production to the right level, uh, either through the mix of um, um, providing the security for oil production uh, and, and uh, uh, reducing the oil tariff and also getting some of the leakages um, that um, uh, reduces the oil revenue uh, to the right uh, level, I think it will also be good. Uh, different incentive that SCBN and um, uh, maybe federal government is also promoting to attract the remittances, foreign direct investment, which is which is very, very important, not um, FPR, foreign portfolio investment. Foreign direct investment is actually what we need in the country attracting the foreign investors to come into the country, bring the money into the country. Uh, I think it will also promote uh, a lot of stability in the, uh, in the Naira that, that, that we have. Uh, I think mix of all these policies, most especially from the monetary point of view, I think will go a long way uh, to address the volatility and also contribute to the acquisition of Naira. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Moshud. Um... Wasil Morade, or if you promised me that you would ask that question in only 30 seconds, then yes, please, you can ask your question. After 30 seconds, I will um, be asking you to round it up. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Oh, sorry, I missed the program along the line. So I just want uh, one simple question in in uh, uh, team with um, in tune with the team of of this program, it's about this uh, new cashless policy. You know, policy formulation and implementation are meant to better the economic variables of a nation. And could anyone, could any of the moderators touch on possible impact of the new CBN cashless or cash withdrawal policy? Do we think it's something that could uh, stimulate the micro and macro? economy of the nation or what that could stifle it my you know uh micro in terms of personal and macro in terms of uh, you know business resources could anyone touch on it what do we think is the impact okay I, that you. question was answered and answered a few minutes ago also but oh, I also wow maybe i missed it at the yes. time i was out Oh, sorry about that. But I know that the link has been shared to watch the program again. So if you don't mind, I'd ask that you please click on it and, and watch that part again. And also the part that you missed when um, the conversation started, if you don't mind. But I'd like to thank everybody. We've run completely out of time now. I'd like to thank all of my panelists it's obvious it was not a mistake that we chose experts such as you and from the experts who delivered the green news with a smile to those who give us a, a straight face. Thank you so much. You started a debate on Whitley that wasn't planned and a debate, two debates actually on whether you know some of our panelists hold the view that the Naira may appreciate further may depreciate further rather uh, to 1,000 to one. Other panelists disagree. I guess, you know, in 2023, we'll see who is right. And maybe we'll call all of you again and say, okay, so yes, prices go to X or Y. And of course, there was also the debate on whether the economy will go into a depression or whether it would experience any kind of growth. Having said this, we're also told uh, we've gotten a very, very thought-provoking 
and something that would propel us forward, assignments from Jimmy, who said right now, and if you haven't done that already, right now, open your phone, open your laptops, open your desktop, open um, Excel, go right into it and start to plan, plan for your debt in December, plan for that. Apart from, from what Jimmy said and the assignments that he gave us, some of the things, strategies for growth for 2023 that the panelists shared is that we should plan, be disciplined with your financial spending, continue to evaluate and reevaluate your plan, be consistent and stick to your budget. Don't make rash decisions when you have your budget, stick with it. Sharpen your financial planning skills. Um, for corporate organizations, some of the strategies that we've been told, oh, I, I forgot. Um, also, Moya dropped some very nice links for us, Zinvest Money Club, Money WIT Club, as some links that we can, we can go to. And for corporate organizations, think of safety nets, have a plan, do scenario planning, check, reevaluate, be nimble, be innovative, improve your product distribution lines, create efficiencies, fully utilize what you, what you have and make sure you maximize it as part of cost saving. And then think through your process. You might find something in your process that you can improve that can help you have cost savings or maximizing efficiencies. And also lastly, optimize your costs as much as possible. And we're also told to think about our borrowing again might want to change your borrowing strategy, knowing that interest rates are going to go up. And thank you very much for all of that. Think about your loans and remember that consumer demand is likely to go down. Explore your value chain again and see how you can create more efficiencies. Think about front loading your cost. So that was so, so big. Think of how to front load your costs. If you have the cash, don't keep cash with you. Invest it and see what you can do. Slow down on physical expansions if you have to, and then reconsider hiring. If you don't have to, then, then maybe you shouldn't. And don't keep cash idle at all. I have so many nuggets here that I have personally and that I will definitely be sharing at our next management meeting. I'd like to thank you very much, Moshud, for your insightful contributions. Rena, thank you for your thought-provoking thoughts that uh, thought-provoking <laughs> comments that you shared. Thank you so much. Bonju, you left us with valuable nuggets and I cannot thank you enough. Um, Muyo, sorry, you were simply, simply amazing and extremely helpful with the things that you gave to us to do right away. And our headmaster, Jimmy, thank you for the assignments that you gave that would definitely help us, not just as individuals, but also our companies. I appreciate all of you, but I know that I'm not as eloquent as one of the directors of um, Kaizen Academy, Mrs. Bukola Olateru, and I'd invite her to come up stage now and then give the vote of thanks as we round up. It was very nice meeting all of you, and I'd like to thank everybody for listening. Bukola, over to you. Thank you, Adiola. I think that was a lot of, you know, impressive eloquence that we've had all day from you. Thank you. Uh, I like, to, well, I, I have the privilege to give the vote of thanks at this uh, very um, insightful and um, thought-provoking webinar. And uh, I'd like to start by appreciating all the participants. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time to listen and send in comments and ask very um, interesting questions. And um, I'm sure you made the, the, the panelists have more thoughts on what they've shared this afternoon. I'll start by thanking Brenna. Rena, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Zimvest Limited. Rena, thank you so much for being here, for sharing with us. Adiola did a lovely recap um, thank you. of some of the things you had shared. Thank you. We very much appreciate you. 
Thank you for taking the time out. It's been about two hours. I'm sure that's a lot of time in your busy schedule. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, permit me, I'm starting with the ladies. So I'll go on to Godju. Godju Fakaya, thank you very much. Let me state again that Godju is the VP Strategy and Transformation for FBN Quest Limited. Thank you, Godju, for being here this afternoon. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you for the insightful comments and responses to our questions. We appreciate you for being here. Thank you so much. I'll also thank move you. on to Moyosore. Moyosore, thank you so much. I really want to appreciate you for being factual. Moyosore said she's one of those who supports the opinion that the dollar may get to 1K before the end of the year. <laughs> That's a very realistic point of view, Moyosore. I hope that it doesn't get there. I hope, but you know, facing the realities of that. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your responses. Thank you for answering our questions and for teaching us and we are much more enlightened. Thank you so much, Moyosore. Moyosore is the group head financial planning and analysis for Tangerine Africa. Thank you, Moya. Now to the gentleman. I'll go to Mr. Moshud. Thank you, Moshud, for being here. Thank you for your um, responses, for your insightful um, and thought-provoking um, points that you've raised. Uh, Moshud is a group finance director for Lotus Capital Limited. Moshud really wants to appreciate you for being here on behalf of the board of Kazen. Say thank you. And then to the headmaster, like Adiola called him, Jimmy. Jimmy really proved himself to be the headmaster. I realized that Jimmy kept on explaining and re-explaining his points and going, you know, further to give us such advice on investments and how to make sure that you're not in a deficit or you are, he actually even get, broke it down to say that if you have, if you earn a hundred naira, you spend a hundred naira at meal. So I'm sure that we have learned a lot today. Jimmy, want to appreciate you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for you know, taking the time to explain and break down this point. Uh, Jimmy is the head of consulting for Augusto and co-consulting. And um, he's uh, in charge of research. And we could see that, you know, um, in, in his responses while he was um, sharing with us. So thank you so much to all the panelists. And on behalf of the board of Kaizen Academy, I'd like to thank you all for being part of this session. And uh, please, you can, as Diola had announced, you can get the, um, the link to this session on YouTube. The link has been shared in the chat. You can go back and listen again. There are more points and there may be some things you missed, especially for uh, the gentleman who said because of the network issue, he couldn't, you know, he missed some points. You can please go back and listen in and uh, gain one or more points to what you've already gained this afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for being part of this session. We appreciate you and we look forward to you joining more of Kaizen Academy sessions. We're going to have more of this in the near future. So please, I'm sure if you found this insightful, you're sure that the next session will be much more insightful. Thank you and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Adiola, kudos to you. Well done. Beautiful moderation. We appreciate you as well. Thank you. Thank you, All right. everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adiola. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Adiola. Thank you for calling. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, Adiola. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.